This show is sponsored by Headnote, helping law firms get paid 70% faster with their compliant e-payments and accounts receivables automation platform. Learn how to get paid quicker and more efficiently at headnote.com. Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and today I'm joined by Professor Aya Gruber, author of The Feminist War on Crime, The Unexpected Role of Women's Liberation in Mass Incarceration. Aya, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Can you first give my listeners a little bit of background as to how you came to write this book? Yeah, it's been a lifelong journey to writing this book. I would put it back to when I was a kid. I always had these two competing progressive sentiments. On one side, I had a deep skepticism of incarceration and the state putting people in prison. And I think that deep skepticism came from the fact that my mother, who's Japanese American, um, was actually interned in a camp during World War II. At the same time, from as far back as I could remember, I had you know feminist instincts. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a justice seeker, and I didn't want the fact that I, I was born a girl, you know, to hold me back. And also had this sense that something that was really part of feminism was fighting against violence against women. So I had these two competing sentiments and I you know, knew I wanted to be a public defender. I knew I wanted to represent people against the power of the state to incarcerate them. And at the same time, I was really worried about having to defend batterers and rapists because that seemed like a very non-feminist thing to do. So I, I had this dilemma that probably peaked when I was in law school. And I was really in a situation where I was dreading becoming this public defender and representing batterers and rapists. So that's sort of the origin of how I started thinking about these tensions between being a critic of policing, prosecution, and incarceration, and also being a good feminist. And I mentioned this to you before we started recording, uh, that often when I'm talking about a book to my listeners, I'll say, oh, you know, this was a really quick read. This was a really easy read. And this was not an easy read for me because it was asking me to engage further than whatever my knee-jerk or instinctive reaction may be and think deeper about what kinds of consequences the urge to punish actually lead to. And I thought that opening with the introduction you did was really powerful in which you talk about a specific case you had, and it's Jamal and Brittany are the couple that ended up facing this uh, domestic violence uh, case. Anyway, I'm, you'll tell it much better than, than I will. Could you talk to my listeners a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So I had mentioned that my dilemma peaked in law school. And the reason it peaked back then is, you know, after law school, I did become a public defender. And I was working in Washington, D.C. And a lot of my cases were in a specialized domestic violence court. And that domestic violence court was really championed by and pushed by feminists in conjunction with, you know, other legal actors in the system. And Once I started practicing in this domestic violence court, I started to dread representing batterers, but for totally other reasons. I saw so many cases where, you know, women called the police for help and they ended up getting their partners and themselves in this revolving door of incarceration. And it was, you know, the majority of the clients and complainants that I saw were poor people of color. And it just seemed that the system wasn't helping them at all. So, you know, I remember the Jamal and Brittany, of course, the names are changed. And, you know, this happened, what, in 2001. So so a while ago, I remember them so clearly, mainly because they were representative of so many cases that I saw. So you have this couple and they're very young. She was maybe 17 or 18 and he was 19. And so therefore in adult court. And she had called the police because he had thrown a plate at her and hit her, right? Not sort of beaten her to a bloody pulp, but definitely a domestic violence assault. 
So by the time I see them, they're, you know, they're for the pretrial part of the hearing for the protection order. And that's part of that domestic violence court, like protection orders are uh, temporary protection orders are automatic, but for the bigger protection order, which can last up to two years, you need a hearing on it. So they're there for the protection order. And they're this cute young couple you know, couple of color, they have a young baby, they live in a neighborhood in DC that, you know, a kid like Jamal is lucky to not have had serious contacts with the police at 19 years old. That's just the kind of neighborhood he was from. So they walk up to me and Brittany said, you know, I called the police because I was scared at the moment. I wanted him out of the house. I didn't know who else to call, but I don't want to pursue this case. I don't want him going to jail. I don't even want to be here. And then she says to me, you know, what will happen if we just leave? And, you know, Jamal, of course, couldn't leave. And I wouldn't let him leave as, as his assigned attorney as public defender. But she could just leave. And the frank answer to her would have been probably, maybe not, right? But, but probably they would dismiss the case. But I can't tell her that, right? I don't want to be, you know, stepping to the line of obstruction of justice. So as I'm talking to her, the domestic violence advocate, which was, I think, a Georgetown or George Washington law clinic student, you know, well-dressed, big diamond ring, lots of files and a designer purse, sort of whisks Brittany away and says, what are you doing talking to my victim?" And I said, well, you know, she came up to me and I don't think she wants to pursue this case. And she said, well, I'm sure, I'm, you know, I'm sure she told you that and sort of whisks her away, whisks her to the council table. We end up in the hearing. Jamal gets a two year stay away order from Brittany, has to leave the house. He can't see the baby. And, you know, that order is put in place before anything criminal happens. Well, fast forward to the criminal trial date. Brittany is a no show. You know, it turns out they had been living together. They never complied with the stay away order and she just didn't come. But one thing that was happening back then is that when the prosecutor wanted to, they said, okay, we're just going to proceed on her statement to the police and the 911 call. In legal parlance, those are called excited utterances. They're hearsay, right? They're not live testimony. But that used to be a pretty common practice before 2004 when it was ruled somewhat unconstitutional. So they say they're going to go forward. And he says, I don't want to go to trial. I don't want to risk jail time. I'll take a plea. So we took the plea. And in specialized domestic violence court, you have to plead guilty, right? It can't be sort of a continuation before a conviction. You have to plead guilty. And then they put you on probation with all these conditions, right? And then if you finish the probation successfully, you'll get a dismissal. But if you don't, you're automatically sentenced, right? So you you plead guilty at the outset. So he did so. And, you know, part of his conditions of release were 27 anger management and domestic violence classes. And they were about $8 at the time. And guess what? He skipped several because he couldn't pay them, right? He was having a hard time after this conviction and the stay away order and everything, keeping a job. So he violated his probation, he failed out of the domestic violence program, and he was sentenced to jail. And that jail conviction and jail sentence, I should say, ended up being the first of several for Jamal because after he went to jail, he struggled. He struggled to get a job, he struggled with drugs. And after that, he was more or less in and out of jail not for domestic violence. Meanwhile, when he was in jail, Brittany and the baby struggled to keep their housing, which they eventually lost because Brittany lost eligibility for public housing because she was residing with Jamal, who had a domestic violence conviction. So I haven't heard about them in, in over 20 years, and it's, it's been a while, and, and I hope that they're doing better now. But the last I heard, Brittany was moving from place to place with the baby and she was still with Jamal. So I definitely want to talk about what alternatives there could be. And I think that 
in this moment, people are more and more open to rethinking what is our relationship to a carceral state? What, what are we actually attempting to do when we help you know, victims? Uh, and I'm, I'm using that word on purpose because you talk a lot about um, victims' rights movements. But first, I think it would be good, as you did in the book, to kind of start at the beginning where the original groups of feminists were attempting to address societal violence towards women and you know women's rights. Could you talk about how this started? Because it, it's interesting to me, especially when I read the subtitle, how women's liberation you know, led to mass incarceration, that really grabbed me. And how did we begin this journey? Yeah, the journey is long, longer than I ever thought. So, you know, after I practice in this domestic violence court and, and, you know, that's just one story with Jamal and it's not a spectacular story. It's just a story of, of every day, unfortunately, every day racism and despair and lack of opportunity that disproportionately affects low income people and people of color and immigrants. And I would see this everyday tragedy over and over again as a public defender in court. I mean, I saw immigrant women, you know, calling the police because again, they wanted help in the situation. They wanted help for the kids, help for themselves, even help for their husbands. But they triggered this unstoppable penal machine that made their husbands and themselves sometimes deportable. So, you know, this wasn't good. So I started to think about, like, well, how did we get here? How did we get here where feminism is sort of this carceral system? And, you know, when I first became a law professor, which was, you know, over, over a decade ago, I was looking at what we call second wave feminism, which is kind of like the late 70s to the 90s. And, you know, what happened there? And that is part of the story. There are definitely was a moment in the 70s through the 90s where feminism was really active in a lot of realms, you know, civil law realm, workplace protection, but also the criminal law realm. And that, you know, second wave feminist movement found so much success at reforming the criminal law of domestic violence towards more police prosecution and punishment and reforming the law of rape to higher sentences, more things counting as sexual assault. And it was at this moment where there was this really salient a political consensus that we should be tough on crime that really crossed the political aisle, right? So you had Reagan and you had Clinton saying, okay, crime control is like this huge issue for us. So there was that moment and I all already kind of knew it. But until I started writing this book, what I didn't realize is that crime control and the effort to fight criminal violence against women lay at the very heart of the very beginning of the women's rights movement, which is you know, traced to Seneca Falls in 1848. Well, one, one of the reasons that women's group wanted the right to vote was they wanted to weigh in on these pressing feminist issues. And sort of highest among them was the double bind that women found themselves in, and especially women who weren't in the upper crust, but women who were married to working class people, say working class men in the North, where they faced this double bind where they would get beaten by the drunkard working husband at home and subject to sexual violence, right? But they had to stay within the home because the only other option was a really horrible workplace for women where you could do menial labor or maybe sex work, right? And so Feminists were really concerned about things like vice, you know, where the men would go out and be licentious and then they'd bring disease home to the wives and beat them. And they were very worried about drunkenness, which they saw as leading to violence against women and, you know, rape and domestic violence. So all these concerns, right, which were a mix of feminist concerns for these these women's situation, horrible situations of being beaten and raped by their drunkard husbands, but also moralistic Christian concerns, right? Temperance concerns over the drink and sex. These melded to be a really formidable 
women's rights agenda in the late 19th century and was very mixed up in the reasons why women wanted the vote. And that's something I didn't realize before writing this book because it was always, the feminist folk knowledge was always that, you know, society has been rape permissive and DV permissive and rape tolerant from time immemorial. And until like the late 20th century, you know, feminists had never had any success in changing the law. Society was way too sexist. So everything began with this criminal law reform in the late 70s through the 90s. I I believe that too, but it simply wasn't true. Feminists uh, at the turn of the century and during the progressive era were wildly successful in their violence against women's reform, which included championing prohibition, right? Because drinking led to wife beating and licentiousness, championing anti-prostitution laws. Why? Because you were protecting women who would be seduced and lured into a life of debauchery. And also age of consent and rape reform laws, where you raise the age of consent to prevent women from getting preyed on, but it also had the effect of outlawing underage sex. So all of these were wildly successful and mainstream feminist criminal law reform campaigns. And you know what? They produced a really mixed bag, right? They protected some women, but the age of consent and anti-prostitution laws landed so many young women in in reformatories, so much so that in the 19 teens, right, like around 1915, there was this massive construction era for girls' reformatories. If you look at the effect of rape reform rhetoric and laws in the post-Civil War South, well, it fomented an epidemic of lynching of Black men accused of you know, various kinds of sexual behavior towards white women. If you look at prohibition laws, it spawned massive systems of policing and surveillance that were often very corrupt. So in any case, what we never hear about the history of, you know, violence against women is that there, from, you know, to, you know, 150 years, there has been a massive crime control effort, and it has produced some consequences that we should understand can repeat themselves, right? Consequences of carcerality that also ensnare women, that disproportionately affect men of color, right? And so I think it's part of the reason why, you know, I think in the 70s and during second wave feminism, feminists went the carceral route is there had been this history, but nobody really knew it. Yeah, that's fascinating. I know that when I was in school learning about prohibition, certainly they talked about how it backfired and led to, you know, incredible organized crime cartels. And But they really didn't focus on the role of women-led t- temperance movements. That was something I, you know, learned later. Yeah, and you can't say that, okay, it was all the temperance movement, it was just some, no, it was an aligning of, you know, temperance with Jim Crow, sometimes feminism and Jim Crow in the South, right? It was the aligning of feminism and social purity movements, right, during the 1920s and the progressive era. But I think that's true of any social movement. And we like to think of feminism as just, you know, a gender justice movement that produces good for women in a vacuum. But it's always found synergy with larger larger social phenomena, slavery, social purity, sex panics, those have always been part of it. You know, no social movement operates in a vacuum. Well, we're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. And when we return, I'll be talking more with Aya about the kinds of alternatives we could be thinking of when it comes to the carceral state. Hey, law firms. Getting paid is fantastic, but dealing with accounts receivable is such a pain. What if there was a better way? In her head note, an industry-leading compliant e-payments and AR automation system. Their unique blend of features cuts through the noise and helps you to get paid 70% faster. Skip the paper checks, spreadsheets, and awkward calls to overdue clients. Get paid faster with less effort. Visit headnote.com for more information. <laughs> 
Welcome back to this episode of the Modern Law Library. I'm here with Aya Gruber, author of The Feminist War on Crime. So we talked about the history, and now I want to focus on the future. If we can look back with more honesty and self-reckoning at the ways in which feminism has allied with forces that led it to a really recriminatory stance and a pro-prison, pro-law enforcement stance, what are some alternatives that people who consider themselves feminists can be looking to and should be looking to? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think with the recent events that have happened where the horrific killing of George Floyd and many other unarmed African Americans and people who suffer brutality at the hands of the police, I think, you know, many young women and activists are recognizing that policing is pretty violent, extremely masculinist. It's, you know, rife with masculine violence. And then what does it result in? It results in a system that puts bodies in cages, in cages that right now are rife with disease and they can't be protected. And that's really putting a spotlight on the perils of this imprisonment model where, you know, when you, when you think of prisons, they're rife with violence and sexual abuse. They, you know, they don't seem like the answer to violence and sexual abuse. And yet, for so many years, you look at domestic violence, sexual harm, you look at the bad abuser, right, who's also probably sexist and feeding the patriarchy, and the natural reaction is, okay, we got to send a message and punish this guy and put him in jail. And that is a very understandable instinct. So I'm not putting down feminists for thinking that. That's the way people you know, have long thought about criminal behavior, that, you know, when somebody does something that's so harmful and so out of the norm and also reinforces inequality, the solution is to be as tough as possible on them. But it turns out that that's not a natural instinct. That's an instinct that was developed over, I would say, 40 years through a politic of tough on crime, right, where politicians for their own political gain were telling the public, hey, you see poverty, you see harm, you see burglary, you see robbery, you see violence. Well, let us tell, let us tell you the solution to those problems. Uh, the solution is policing, prosecution, and punishment. It's crime control. It isn't, you know, money, welfare, social safety nets, social safety net services. It's not any of those things. What it is, is policing. And so many politicians, you know, floated into office on that kind of crime control rhetoric. And over time, it almost became instinctive, right? It, it became this thing that people thought, oh, yeah, what is the appropriate solution to individuals harming other individuals? Well, it's putting people in prison. So I understand you know, why feminists thought that, that that was sort of the way to go when you're trying to fight violence against women. But I think people are looking with a very critical eye at the carceral system these days and saying, you know, maybe that isn't the best way to address these harms. Okay, so your question is, what is the best way to address these harms? Well, I think the first thing is we have to try to fight that instinct to think that the only way to send a message that violence against women is unacceptable is to put men in a jail rife with, rife with gender violence. I, I think that's the first thing. And that if you have the energy that you want to put towards the fight against violence against women, I think that you have to look at where this violence is occurring. One of the other sort of myths that have grown up in feminism is that violence equally affect all women across the racial and socioeconomic spectrum, and that is just not true. Poor women of color are more vulnerable to violence, not just from intimate partners or people who commit sexual violence, but also from the police. And so we should start there and understand what the women most vulnerable to violence 
need. And they've told us, they've told us through the social science and through surveys that what many of them need is housing and shelter, childcare, resources to support their household, job training, employment opportunities. There are so many unmet needs amongst the community most vulnerable to gender violence that just go completely unfulfilled when we put all our eggs in the criminal law basket. And there are many organizations that reach out to women with services, you know, local, national. There's a great uh, website for resources on non-carceral ways to address violence against women. It's called Insight with uh, an exclamation point. Uh, Last week, I wrote a Slate article that lists many of the alternatives. There's a great 2017 CDC report on domestic violence as a public health problem. So all of these approaches are ways to address violence against women and thereby address sexism in society without supporting a carceral system that is in and of itself pretty hyper-masculine and sexist when you think about it. One of the things that I've been thinking about personally and in my own life is I, like many other women, and and I am a white woman, I have noticed that there's a real fixation on true crime, you know, true crime podcasts, true crime TV shows and, and movies. And I actually remember I was, I was born in 1980 and my mother talks about how that was a time period in which the message of stranger danger was everywhere. And I remember as a very small child watching this video uh, that my parents had bought for me called strong kids, safe kids that was trying to communicate to children, all the dangers that surround them. And it really does make me think, and in reading this book, I thought about it again, how consuming all of that content in which the message, which is usually directed to, or often directed to specifically white women, because crimes against women of color and trans women do not get as much um, attention by far by the media. The message is, you are in danger, you are in danger. The only thing that can save you perhaps is is the police and the legal system. Is that something that you think about too, how we in our own lives could maybe re-examine the kind of pop culture or media that we consume to try and have a more realistic idea of what are the actual dangers against me? That is such a great point. And in my book, you know, I devote an entire chapter to the victims' rights movement and sort of the rhetoric of predators and prey and tough on crime and how that had a sort of symbiotic relationship to some of the narratives that feminists were using to describe men who commit violence against women. And it's really true that, you know how they say, you know, sugar is so addictive because it tweaks our evolutionary biological senses to, you know, seek out something sweet. Well, these very simplistic crime narratives do the same thing, right? We're wired to sort of have that, you know, not to sound postmodern, but that sentimentality towards absolutely innocent victim martyrs and completely abandoned evil perpetrators. That's just a narrative that feels good, right? It feels good because it doesn't require us to do the hard moral work of figuring out social and other structures that underlie harms, right? And so in this feel-good rhetoric, we not only had politicians saying, hey, look, I'm going to be the one that gets the bad guys, you know, vote for me, but we also have media, popular media, and, you know, fictional shows that portray these black and white polar good guys and and bad guys. And then, you know, one more thing within the media, the good, it's also very gendered, right? Because you have a child or a woman and raced, a white woman subjected to this horrific violence at the hands of a deviant or, a, you know, a minority super predator, predator, and then the good cop 
sort of swoops in. So this sort of primes us all for a certain way of thinking about policing prosecution and imprisonment that is wholly untrue. Now, I'm more sympathetic to the true crime stories because a lot of those are, are is he really innocent and putting together the, the clues of one big case. But if you look at a lot of the, you know, SVU or Death Wish or some of the popular movies and TV shows from the 70s to the 90s, they really were about street crime terrorizing everybody and cops coming in, declaring war and cleaning it up. So, you know, I would say this to, to true crime podcast listeners right now. Those aren't the crimes that we see in our system. 80% of the arrests are for misdemeanors. The vast majority of domestic violence cases are misdemeanors. In fact, the majority of sexual violence cases are misdemeanors. These are low-level crimes, right? These aren't murder, you know, horrible, brutal maiming and rape and whodunits, right? Those are a very small percentage of the crimes. And frankly, when it comes to rape whodunits, a lot of the times what police do is they gather the evidence and they sit on the DNA, right? They could find out who done it. And then we could decide what to do with those people who maybe can't re be rehabilitated and need some incapacitation. But that's not what's going on the majority of the time in the system. The majority of the time is what you have is police sweeping black and brown communities, arresting people for low level crimes and starting the revolving door of incarceration, lack of employment, collateral consequences and despair that Jamal and Brittany went through. And once you realize that, you can still be interested in the extremely deviant offender whose crime really needs to be solved because they're a serial killer or a repeat offender and needs to be incapacitated. But you can divorce that interest from what really goes on in the American prison state, because that's not what goes on. What goes on in the American prison state is a control of people of color and a, a further entrenchment of second class citizenship. And we can still solve and deal with the worst of the worst of the crimes and seriously reform, even some would say, abolish the rest of that system. So when it comes to sexual assault and defining what sexual assault and rape involve, it is interesting to me, you go into how different generations have looked at these definitions and had, have tried to define, well, what, what makes it an assault? What, what makes it rape? And one of the interesting things I found was you talk about how millennial feminists are wrestling with kind of a contradiction when it comes to the definitions of sexual assault that are extremely firm and punitive and another instinct they have that this you know, heavy punitive sentencing is not actually helpful for solving the problem. Could you talk a little bit, and it's, it's hard because a great deal of your book is devoted to this, but could you talk a little bit for my listeners about this debate when it comes to how do we define what is assault and rape? Right. So that is a true dilemma, I think, for many of, you know, now sort of in their, their 30s, but many of the college-aged feminists in, say, 2012 to 2015, who were really at the forefront of the campus anti-rape movement. And so for people not familiar with that, there was a period of time where it was in the news all the time that college-aged women were really speaking out against sexual assault, right, which ranged from sort of being forcibly raped to drunken sex situations that were just not good, but it wasn't clear how to categorize them. But anyway, too many of these bad sexual situations were occurring, and there was this massive campus protest, and it aligned with the interests, let's say, of the Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights under President Obama, and this office 
issued guidelines. And we, and we, we just shorthand it now as Title IX because that's the regulation that led to the guidelines. And the guidelines basically said, hey, colleges, you have to take campus sexual assault more seriously. You have to investigate these cases. You have to you know, find responsibility. You can't be giving everybody a slap on the wrist. You have to recognize a broad array of this conduct as sexual assault. And if you don't, not only will you be sued by the federal government, but you're going to look really bad. You're going to look like a rape permissive campus, right? So campuses sort of fell all over themselves to have the most quote unquote progressive definitions of rape and the most progressive hearing processes. Well, in this context, with everybody in an anti-rape fervor, progressive meant the broadest definitions of rape that we could find, right, that go way past anything in the criminal law. So, for example, affirmative consent, right, people have heard that term being defined quite literally as a yes, and in some campus publications, an enthusiastic yes. So whenever two people have sex and a yes isn't uttered, it's a, it's, it's, you know, a campus disciplinary violation. It doesn't matter if everything else was lovely. There was no yes, right? So that kind of a definition or, you know, drunkenness, right? Drunkenness defined as you don't know the who, what, when, where, and why of having sex. So that, you know, could be arranged. So these very broad and vague definitions that could get somebody labeled a rapist. And frankly, you know, it's interesting because you see some court suits these days where two students are drunk, the girl will accuse the guy, and then the guy will accuse the girl. And technically under the definition, both are victims and both are perpetrators. And how do you figure that out? So these very broad definitions. And then at the same time, this notion that if you give the respondent, right, if you give the person accused of being an assaulter too much process, right, you allow them a hearing, you allow them cross-examination, you allow them to look at discovery, well, then you're traumatizing the victim, so you shouldn't give them process. So the two progressive ideas that sort of came out of this era in any other context would be completely conservative, right? Broad criminal definitions that put a lot of people in jail and watered down due process. So that's the sort of campus rape activism side. And where the millennial feminists felt really conflicted is, okay, you know, I want these kind of conservative things because I'm really anti-rape on campus and that's where my political energy goes. But at the same time, you know, I've seen the George Zimmerman killing of Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland and, and, you know, Michael Brown and all these cases coming up. And I agree with the Black Lives Matter movement, which has a broad structural critique of policing and sort of the entire prison state. So is there a way I can separate these two things? And I think what a lot of the younger feminists were saying at the time is, yes, the way I can reconcile these two seemingly you know, irreconcilable things is I can point out that getting kicked out of college and getting disciplined in college is totally different and totally separate from being put in jail. And so I can be really disciplinary in the college space and be really anti-carceral in the other space, right? So that's kind of how they dealt with the dilemma. And my argument is, you know, and I devote a chapter to it, so it's hard to, you know, say it in a nutshell, I'm not so sure, right? Like, I'm not so sure that these sentiments don't bleed. So first of all, when you look at the campus disciplinary process, we don't have great statistics on it, but we know this from primary and secondary school and high schools, that African Americans are disproportionately subject to school discipline. That it's it's a fact of criminal law, and it is a fact of school discipline plainly. We also know this from the Civil War, from before the Civil War on, notions of Black maleness and notions of sexual deviance or sexual prowess or sexual predation have always been mixed up with each other Um, to the point where a famous historian, Estelle Friedman, said, we can't understand the American 
concept of rape if we divorce it from attitudes towards race in the post-Civil War South. We just can't even understand it. So we know those two things are true. So that doesn't bode well for the distribution of campus discipline. And then also, you know, with affirmative consent, making such a splash, for example, the quote unquote, yes means yes law in California, which I think was passed around 2016. Well, this has bled into a lot of prosecutorial practices to the point where you can see these, you know, best practice white papers to prosecutors that are saying, hey, look, you should be telling the jury to interpret consent as only yes means yes, right? So it's not as though that hasn't influenced prosecutors' views of, you know, what it is to commit a sexual assault. So it broadened it in the college context, and that has bled over into the prosecutorial context. And then the third thing, and I think a lot of civil libertarians have said this, you know, this notion that due process is antithetical to victims, that is not a notion that grew up in the Title IX campus rape context. That is a notion that was directly a result of the Reagan tough on crime era and the very politically powerful victims' rights movement who in conjunction, you know, I talk a lot about the origins of the victims' rights movement, and it didn't start out as a conservative tough on crime movement, but quite shortly within a war on crime mentality, it became all about countering defendants' due process rights that the Warren court, that famous liberal court had built. And so it was really that moment that cemented the rhetoric that giving defendants rights against the state was anti-victim. So then when you sort of, you know, bring up this rhetoric over and over again in a progressive context on the campus rape front, you know, I only see it bleeding into the criminal law context where it's just supporting those arguments that have been very successfully made for many years, which have watered down criminal defendants' rights. So another aspect in the book that you get into and explain the the history behind it becoming the kind of activity or social problem that is being heavily policed is domestic violence. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the things I've noticed coming up in the wake of the worldwide protests against racialized policing is this question about, well, if we defund the police what's going to happen when women call for domestic violence and rape. And there's a really interesting part of the book where I tell the story of how policing actually became the solution to domestic violence. Because when you look at the beginning of the battered women's movement in the mid seventies, most of the women involved in it were very anti-police, right? They had just come off the late sixties where there was, you know, Vietnam war protest style leftism abounding and where police were seen in these horrific scenes, very reminiscent of today, where they were beating on protesters. So women's rights advocates and battered women's advocates who came out of these left movements really didn't see police as a panacea. But just one thing led to another, and there were lawsuits. And soon by the mid 80s, right in the tough on crime era, policing became a centerpiece of battered women's activism. And one of the reasons is it's what they could get money for. It's what the legislatures were going for. They would agree with battered women's advocates that these men should be arrested and go to jail, but they wouldn't necessarily be giving the money for the shelters or for the services, right? So then you had a situation where, you know, much like in Jamal's case that I talked about in the beginning, when police were called to a scene, the policy of the department or the state would say, you have to make a domestic violence arrest, right? And if you don't, you know, there's going to be a problem. And so what we saw was a massive increase in domestic violence arrests. Police were not allowed to tell them to take a walk or to do a temporary removal or just to bring her to a shelter. They had to make an arrest. And not only did this lead to an uptick in arrests of men, it led to a serious uptick in arrests of women because basically what you told police was don't exercise any discretion. If anybody has committed violence in the home, 
arrest them. So for example, in California, they did this study where they compared arrest rates before and after these mandatory arrest policies. And they found that the mandatory arrest policy increased domestic violence arrests of men by 60%. But they increased domestic violence arrests of women by 400%. And if you look at the incarcerated population of women, there are a lot of women there for domestic violence crimes. And women for the past decade or so have been the fastest growing segment of the prison population. So that's one of the things that happened. Another thing that happened was that social scientists started doing these studies on whether these arrest policies were actually reducing domestic violence. And they really showed a mixed bag. By the end of the 80s, it was pretty clear that for white middle-class women married to employed white men, there were possibly some deterrent effects, right, in the long term. But for women living in lower income communities of color partnered with unemployed men of color, there was an escalatory effect to arrest. In other words, it was more like Jamal's case, right? Arrest created this cycle of in and out of jail, which just compounded the problems suffered by the men and the women. So it wasn't this wake up call that maybe it was for some of the white men. It was actually just entrenching a, a violence cycle. So by the late 80s, the leading social scientists were saying, you know, whatever marginal benefits this carceral system might have for majority women, it's really decimating these minority couples and we should stop it. And what was interesting was that feminists weren't willing to give up on the program. And I have it in my book and I won't repeat it here, but they used pretty racially charged rhetoric to argue that the solution was to be even tougher on Black men because they weren't getting the message from arrest alone. So feminists really found synergy with that tough on crime moment where the solution to the problem of domestic violence was just getting more and more and more and more and more tough. And it flew in the face of this proof that no, these arrests weren't working for people of color. They weren't working for the most marginalized women. They weren't working for the men who were caught in this revolving door cycle. And they were actually leading to the arrest of women. And so, you know, one of the horrible results of that is given all these negative repercussions of domestic violence, tough policing, right? This tough on crime, tough on DV policing was that women at risk stopped calling the police. And at least one study correlated these mandatory policies to an increase in domestic violence homicides. And the argument was when women call for help and all they get is the carceral machine, they're not going to call for help anymore. And they're not going to call for help when help is needed the most. So this idea that policing is the solution to violence, it doesn't hold true in general. And it doesn't hold true in the domestic violence context. So as a law professor, when you talk to your students and you encourage these kinds of reflections and thought experiments of, well, what could we do instead? How did we get here? What has been their response? I'm just interested in what the, the next generation of lawyers is really thinking about. Well, I can tell you that I presented chapters of the book at two seminars, one I taught at Harvard when I was visiting there and one I taught at the University of Colorado uh, with students in a feminist and crime control seminar at Harvard and students in my criminal law in context seminar that I, that I teach every year at University of Colorado. And their feedback on my chapters, and, and, and let me tell you, you know, a lot of the people that take my courses, they are coming from that victim's advocate campus rape background. Their, their comments on, you know, where I think this was too strong or, uh, you know, I think you could put it a different way or what a millennial feminist is or, you know, what their experiences are, were just invaluable in writing this book. I don't think I could have written this book without my students. So I owe them just such a great debt of gratitude when you talk about sexual assault, it really is, when you look at the statistics, a phenomenon 
of people between 18 through 35. And, it, and if you factor in date rape, even more, you know, so having aged out of, you know, where any of this is relevant to me, you know, it's, it's really been a lot of my students feedback about what's going on in campus that have helped me. So that's the first thing in presenting this, you know, really difficult work. I mean, dealing with people who are imprisoned and people who suffer from police violence, that's a triggering topic. Race is a potentially triggering topic and sexual and domestic violence are also triggering. These are all the untouchable topics. And if you ask any of my corporate law colleagues, they'll say to me, well, thank God, you know, like I don't have to teach that. But at the same time, I find that the students are so invested in these topics and just have really great things to say and these insights that are invaluable. So I'm glad that I'm able to talk about it in a small group setting. It's a little more difficult in my, you know, like 80, 90 people criminal law course to teach rape because you just don't have the time to talk about all the history and the peculiarities of it. And it's it's even hard to talk about criminal law as part of a carceral system that has a history and you know has partially history in slave patrols or anti-union work. It's just hard to teach any of that in a criminal law course because you're teaching doctrine, you're teaching things like mens rea and causation and actus reus, but I try. And I hope that the students appreciate it because you know, I know that out of fear of, you know, offending people or teaching it the wrong way, a lot of my colleagues in the criminal law area, they don't teach sexual assault. They don't teach anything having to do with sex. And I think that's unfortunate, especially for women, because there used to be a point in time when women were first admitted to law schools where the male criminal law professors, because all professors were male, said, oh, well, you know, we should teach rape because this is, you know, a very important and horrific crime, but the women will be excused from the class because, you know, it's too delicate for them to hear. And so I think, you know, it would be unfortunate to bring that back. And also it would be unfortunate because this is an area where I think women with gender justice sentiments who, who want to use their law degree to do something good for the world. They're really interested in this topic. So if you don't teach it, how are they going to learn about this fascinating, difficult, painful, but important topic? I also think it's very problematic to, but I think we do, to gender it in such a way that women are always considered victims and men are always considered perpetrators and then not taking into account the male or non-binary victims of rape and sexual assault. And I think that complicates their journeys as well. I think it's really hard for feminists to do the, the, the double, you know, the two-step on that, where they both want to be gender neutral and be a feminist. It just doesn't work all that well, because one of the reasons why, from the very beginning, women's rights groups focused on things like domestic violence and rape was, yes, it harmed individual people. Like we never like it when things harm individual people, but they saw it as part of a patriarchal structure that in particular oppressed women. And maybe you could also fold in, you know, today, trans women, because back in, you know, the turn of the century, there probably were trans women, but just nobody talked about that in terms of gender violence. But it's very hard for them to fold in straight men as victims and straight women as perpetrators, because that doesn't really go along the patriarchal front, right? And one of the reasons why feminists are so concerned with this type of violence is that it reflects and reinforces women in particular's subordinate status. So when you play with the genders like that, it becomes a situation where sexual harm is, is, is a crime, right? It's a harmful, violent crime, but it's not particularly a crime of women's subordination. I think that the feminist claim, which, you know, I agree with, I think that all forms of sexual violence are bad, right? Whenever anybody feels harmed, that's bad. Those are problems. You know, I'm not saying that the reason I'm against 
the carceral state is because I don't think any of these crimes are problems. No, I think they're massive problems. But I think what feminists are saying, and you know, as a feminist, I agree with this in a way, is that there is something about belonging to the category of woman by social construction or by some other construction that makes you uniquely vulnerable to discrimination, right? In a way that men aren't. Now, this doesn't mean it's the only site of discrimination, that it's the only identity that's subordinated. Or maybe it doesn't even mean that, you know, in the larger scheme of things, you're generally a subordinated person. But there is some there there, right? So when we talk about rape, we do talk about the ways in which it reinforces the subordination of women in particular. So I think that's why it's really hard for feminists to say, okay, you know, all sexual assault is equal. But I think the problem with that in feminism has, has been this sense that, you know, for feminists, it was always that men subordinating women, right? And then men as this monolithic group and women as this monolithic group is the most important form of subordination such that all means should be used against it. And the two problems with that were one, when you have these monolithic or sometimes called essentialist views of men, bad oppressor, woman, vulnerable, subordinated party, well, they tend to translate into white men and white women And so then all your policies are geared towards the sort of privileged white man who, you know, uh, offends against vulnerable white women and what they would want in that space. So that's one problem with sort of just seeing things in terms of gender. And then the second and related problem is that, you know, people are multiple identities. They're intersecting identities. And maybe, you know, like take Amy Cooper. Maybe if Amy Cooper goes to work, you know, she's now been fired, but as an investment banker, maybe she can be sexually harassed by her boss and she would be subordinated by him doing that. But in the context of the power that she had vis-a-vis the police and Christian Cooper, she was not the subordinated party, right? So I think one of the problems people have had with that sort of hardcore men dominate, women are subordinated point of view is that it, it was one of the reasons it was successful was that it was so simple, but it was so simple that it produced policies in the name of protecting women and produced ideologies in the name of protecting women that did a lot of harm to people who sort of weren't this iconic white woman subjected to horrific violence by a privileged white man. And most of the people caught in the system didn't fit into those two images. And I really do recommend people pick up The Feminist War on Crime and read the chapter on ideal victims. That was a really good and eye-opening section of the book for me. I, uh, if my listeners are interested in finding out more, in finding your book, in reaching out to you, how could they do that? Yes. Well, I'm currently working on a website, but that's up and coming. But you can always email me at aya.gruber at colorado.edu. I have joined Twitter a few months back, so it's at Aya Gruber. And I really just want to say this. My book, the title is A Feminist War on Crime, and some people think it's going to be a polemic against feminism. And it really isn't. I really wanted to look at this dilemma I had about being a good feminist and being anti-incarceration and really figure out what led us to this moment where so much feminist energy, certainly not all, is being put into policing and prosecution and the carceral state. And I really think that this is the first book to do that, to really trace how we got here. And it traces how we got here so we can do better. Um, And that's really my hope for this book. And as someone who's read the book, I can confirm it really feels much more like a call that's coming from inside the house in that, you know, you are you are examining and you are critiquing, but it did not come across to me, the reader, as like you said, a polemic against feminism. 
great. I'm glad. I'm glad for that. But yeah, so yeah, you you can pick up the book at Amazon or at the University of California Press website. And um, you know, I hope you enjoy it because it really does trace the origins and the important moments of feminist criminal law reform throughout the ages and the strange bedfellows that were made and how feminism at once made progress and helped women, but at the same time reinforced other structures and particularly the structures that today are concerning so many people. And so once again, the author is Aya Gruber and the title of the book is The Feminist War on Crime, The Unexpected Role of Women's Liberation in Mass Incarceration. Thank you to all my listeners for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. Please rate, review, and subscribe in your favorite podcast listening service.